English Characteristics by John Burroughs England is a mellow country, and the English people are a mellow people. They have hung on the tree of nations a long time, and will no doubt hang as much longer, for windfalls, I reckon, are not the order in this island. We are pitched several degrees higher in this country. By contrast, things are loud, sharp, and garish. Our geography is loud, the manners of the people are loud, our climate is loud, very loud, so dry and sharp and full of violent changes and contrasts, and our goings out and comings in as a nation are anything but silent. Do we not occasionally give the door an extra slam just for an effect? In England, everything is on a lower key, slower, steadier, gentler. Life is no doubt as much full as full or fuller in its material forms and measures, but less violent and aggressive. The buffers the English have between their cars to break the shock are typical of much one sees there. All sounds are softer in England. The surface of things is less hard. The eye of day and the face of nature are less bright. Everything has a mellow, subdued cast. There is no abruptness of the landscape, no sharp and violent contrasts, no brilliant and striking tints in the foliage. A soft, pale yellow is all one sees in the way of tints along the borders of the autumn woods. English apples, very small and inferior, by the way, are not so highly colored as ours. The blackberries, just ripening in October, are less pungent and acid, and the garden vegetables, such as cabbage, celery, cauliflower, beet, and other root crops are less rank and fibrous, and I am very sure that the meats are also tenderer and sweeter. There can be no doubt about the superiority of mutton, and the tender and succulent grass and the moist and agreeable climate must tell upon the beef also. <clears throat> English coal is all soft coal, and the stone is soft stone. The foundations of the hills are chalk instead of granite. The stone with which most of the old churches and cathedrals are built would not endure in our climate half a century, but in Britain the tooth of time is much blunter, and the hunger of the old man less ravenous, and the ancient architecture stands half a millennium, or until it is slowly worn away by the gentle attrition of the wind and rain. At Chester, the old Roman wall that surrounds the town, built in the first century and repaired in the ninth, is still standing without a break or swerve though in some places the outer face of the wall is worn through. The cathedral and St. John's Church in the same town present to the beholder outlines as jagged and broken as rocks and cliffs. And yet it is only chip by chip or grain by rain that ruin approaches. The timber also lasts an incredibly long time. Beneath one of the arched ways in the Chester Wall above referred to, I saw timbers that must have been in place five or six hundred years. The beams in the old house, also fully exposed to weather, seem incapable of decay, those dating from Shakespeare's time being apparently as firm as ever. I noticed that the characteristic aspect of the clouds in English, England was different from ours, soft, fleecy, vaporary, indistinguishable, Never the firm, compact, sharply defined, deeply dyed masses and fragments so common in our own sky. It rains easily but slowly. The average rainfall of London is less than that of New York, and yet it, it doubtless rains ten days in the former to one in the latter. Storms accompanied with thunder are rare, while the crashing, wrenching, explosive thunder gusts so common with us, divulging the earth and convulsing the heavens, are seldom known. In keeping with this elemental control and moderation, I found the character and manners of the people gentler and sweetler, sweeter than I had been led to believe they were. No loudness, brazenness, brazenness, impertinence, no oaths, no swaggering, no leering at women, no irreverence, no flippancy, no bullying, no insolence of porters or clerks or conductors, no importunity of boot blacks or newsboys, no omnivorousness of hackmen, at least comparatively none, all of which an American is apt to notice, and I hope appreciate. In London, the bootblack salutes you with a respectful bow and touches his cap, and would, and would no more think of pursuing you or answering your refusal than he would of jumping into the Thames. 
The same is true of the newsboys. If they were to scream and bellow in London as they do in New York or Washington, they would be suppressed by the police, and they ought to be. The vendor of papers stands at the corner of the street with his goods in his arms and a large placard spread out at his feet, giving in big letters the principal news headings. Street car cries of all kinds are less noticeable, less aggressive than in the, this country, and the manners of the shopmen make you feel you are conferring a benefit instead of, of receiving one. Even their locomotives are less noisy than ours, having a shrill infantile whistle that contrasts strongly with the loud demonic yell that makes a residence near a railway or depot in this country so unbearable. The trains themselves move with wonderful smoothness and celerity, making a mere fraction of the racket made by our flying palaces as they go swaying and jolting over our hasty, ill-ballast roads. It is characteristic of the English prudence and plain dealing that they put so little on the cars and so much on the road, while the reverse process is equally characteristic of American enterprise. Our railway system no doubt has certain advantages or rather conveniences over the English, but for my part I had rather ride smoothly, swiftly, and safely in a luggage van than be jerked and jolted to destruction in the velvet and veneering of our palace cars. Upholster the road first and let, let us ride on bare boards until a cushion can be afforded, not till after the bridges are of granite and iron and the rails of steel do we want this more than aristocracy. Arist aristocratic splendor and luxury of place, palace, and drawing-room cars. To me there is no more marked sign of the essential vulgarity of the national manners than these princely cars and beggarly clap-trap roads. It is like a man wearing a ruffled and jeweled shirt-front, but too poor to afford a shirt himself, itself. I have said that the English are a sweet and mellow people. There is indeed a charm about these ancestral races that goes to the heart. And herein was one of my of the profoundest surprises of my visit, namely that in coming from new, the new world to the old, from a people that most recently, the most recently out of the woods of any, to one of the ripest and venerablest of the European nationalities, I should find a race more simple, youthful, and less sophisticated than the one I had left behind. Yet this was my impression. We have lost immensely in some things, and what we have gained is not so obvious or so definable we have lost in reverence in homeliness in heart and conscience in virtue using the word in its proper sense to some the difference which i note may appear a difference in favor of the greater greater cuteness wide awakeness and enterprise of the american but is simply a difference expressive of our greater forwardness we are a forward people and the god we worship is smartness in one of the worst tendencies of the age, namely in impudent, superficial, journalistic intellectuality and glibness, America, in her polite and literary circles, no doubt leads all other nations. English books and newspapers show more homely veracity, more singleness of purpose, in short, more character than ours. The great charm of such a man as Darwin, for instance, is his simple manliness and transparent good faith and the absence in him of that phaniacal, self-complacent smartness which is the bane of our literature. The poet Claude thought, of New England, thought the New England man was more simple than the man of Old England. Hawthorne, on the other hand, seemed reluctant to admit that the English were a franker and simpler people from pure to peasant than we are, and that they had not yet wandered so far from that healthful and primitive simplicity in which man was created, as have their descendants in America. My own impression accords with Hawthorne's. We are a more alert and cur curious people, but not so simple, not so easily angered, nor so easily amused. We have partaken more largely of the fruit of the forbidden tree. The English have more of the stay-at-home virtues, which, on the other hand, they no doubt pay pretty well for by their mere, more insular tendencies. The youths and maidens seem more simple, with their softer and less intellectual faces. When I returned from Paris, the only person in the second-class compartments of the car with me for a long distance was an English youth, 18 or 20 years old, returning home to London after an absence of nearly a year, which he had spent as waiter in a Parisian hotel. He was born in London and had spent nearly his whole life there, where his mother, a widow, then lived. He talked very freely with me and told me his troubles and plans and hopes as if we had long known each other. What especially struck me in the youth was a kind of sweetness and innocence, perhaps 
what some would call greenness that at home I had associated only with country boys, and not even with them laterly. The smartness and knowingness and a certain hardiness or keenness of our city youths, there was no trace of it at all in this young Cockney, but he liked American travelers better than those from his own country. They were more friendly and communicative, were not so afraid to speak to a fellow, and at the hotel were more easily pleased. The American is certainly not the grumbler the Englishman is. He is more cosmopolitan and conciliatory. The Englishman will not adapt himself to his surroundings. He is not the least bit an imitative animal. He will be nothing but an Englishman and is out of place and is out of place an anomaly in any country but his own. To understand him, you must see him at home in the British island where he grew, where he belongs, where he has expressed himself and justified himself, and his interior unconscious characteristics are revealed. There he is quite a different creature from what he is abroad. <clears throat> There he is sweet, but he sours the moment he steps off the island. In this country he is too generally arrogant, fault-finding, and supercilious. The very traits of loudness, sharpness, and unleavenness leavenness, which I complain of in our national manners he very frequently exemplifies in an exaggerated form. The Scotch or German element no doubt fuses and mixes with ours much more readily than the purely British. The traveler fears feels the past in England as, of course, he cannot feel it here, and along with impressions of the present, one gets the flavor and influence of earlier simple time, simpler times, which no doubt is a potent charm, and one source of the rose color which some readers have found in my sketches as the absence of it is one cause of the raw, acrid, unlovely character of much there is in this country. If the English are the old wine, we are the new. We are not yet thoroughly leavened as a people, nor have we more than begun to transmute and humanize our surroundings as the digestive and assimilative powers of the American are clearly less than those of the Englishman, to say nothing of our harsher, more violent climate. I have no idea that ours can ever be the mellow land that Britain is. As for the charge of brutality that is often brought against the English, and which is so successfully depicted by Dickens and Thackeray, there is no doubt there is doubtless good ground for it, though I actually see very little of it during five weeks' residence in London, I, and I poked about into all the dens and corners I could find and perambulated the streets at nearly all hours of the night and day. Yet I am persuaded there is a kind of brutality among the lower orders in England that does not exist in the same measure in this country, an ignorant animal coarseness, an insensibility which gives rise to wife-beating and kindred offenses." But the brutality of ignorance and stolidity is not the worst form of the evil. It is good material to make something better of. It is an excess and not a perversion. It is not man fallen, but man undeveloped. Beware, rather, that refined, subsidized brutality, that thin, depleted moral consciousness, or that contemptuous, cankerous, euphemistic brutality of which I believe we can show vastly more samples than Great Britain. Indeed, I believe for the most part that the brutality of the English people is only the excess and plethora of that healthful, muscular robustness and full-bloodedness for which the nation has always been famous and which it should prize beyond almost anything else for our brutality, our recklessness of life and property, the brazen ruffianism in our great cities, the hellish greed and robbery and plunder in high places. I should have to look a long time to find so plausible an excuse." But I notice with pleasure that English travelers are beginning to find more to admire than to condemn in this country, and that they accredit us with some virtues they do not find at home in the same measure. They are charmed with the independence, the self-respect, the good nature, and the obliging disposition shown by the mass of our people, while American travelers seem to be more and more ready to acknowledge the charm and the substantial qualities of the mother country. It is a good omen. One principal source of the pleasures which each takes in the order is no doubt to be found in the novelty of the impressions. It is like a change of cookery. The flavor of the dish is fresh and uncloying to each. The English probably tire of their own snobbishness and flunkyism, and we of our own smartness and puppyism. After the American has got done bragging about his independence and his free and equal prerogatives, he begins to see how these things run into impertinence and forwardness, and the Englishman in visiting us escapes from his social bonds and prejudices to see for a moment how absurd they all are. 
A London crowd I thought the most normal and unsophisticated I had ever seen with the least admixture of rowdyism and roughinism. No doubt it is there, but the scum is not upon the surface as with us. I went about freely in the hundred and one places of amusement where the average working classes assemble and with their wives and daughters and sweethearts and smoke villainous cigar cigars and drink ale and stout. There was to me something notably fresh and canny about them, as if they had only yesterday ceased to be shepherds and shepherdesses. They certainly were less developed in certain directions, or, shall I say, depraved, than similar crowds in our great cities. They are easily pleased and laugh at the simple and childlike, but there is little that hints of an impure taste or of abnormal appetites. I often smiled at the tameness and simplicity of the amusements, but my sense of fitness or proportion or decency was never once outraged. They always stop short of certain at of a certain point, the point where wit degenerates into mockery and liberty into license. Nature is never put to shame and will commonly bear much more. Especially to the American sense did their humorous and economic strokes, their Negro ministrelicy, and attempts at Yankee comedy seem in a minor key. There was not enough irreverence in slang and coarse ribaldry. In the whole evening's entertainment to have seasoned one line of some of our most popular comic poetry, but the music and the gymnastic, acrobatic, and other feats were of a very high order. And I will say here that the characteristic flavor of the humor and fun-making of the average English people, as it impressed my sense, is what one gets in stern. Very human and stomachic. St stomach. Stomachic and entirely free from the contempt and superciliousness of most current writers. I did not get one whiff of Dickens anywhere. No doubt it is there in some form or other, but it is not patent or even appreciable to the sense of such an observer as I am. I was not less pleased by the simple goodwill and bonhomie that pervade the crowd. There is in all these gatherings an indiscriminate mingling of the sexes, a mingling without jar or noise or rudeness of any kind, and marked by a mutual respect on all sides that is novel and refreshing. Indeed, so uniform is the courtesy, and so human and considerate the interest that I was often at a loss to discriminate the wife or the sister from the mistress or the acquaintance of the hour, and had many times to check my American curiosity and cold, criticizing stare. For it is with for it was curious to see young men and women from the lowest social strata meet and mingle in a public hall without lewdness or badinage. But even with gentleness and consideration, the truth is, however, that the class of women known as victims of the social evil do not sink within, any, with, within many degrees as low in Europe as they do in this country, either in their own opinion or in that of the public, and there can be but little doubt that gatherings of this of the kind referred to, if permitted in our great cities, would be tenfold more scandalous and disgraceful than they are in London or Paris. There is something so reckless and desperate in the career of man or woman in this country when they begin to go down that the only feeling that, the only feeling that they too often excite is one of loathsomeness and disgust. The lowest depth must be reached, and it is reached quickly. But in London the same characteristics seem to keep a sweet side from corruption to the last, and you will see good manners everywhere. We boast of our own deference to women, but if the old world made her a tool, we are fast making her a toy, and the latter is, more, is the more hopeless condition. But among the better classes of England, I am convinced that woman is regarded more as a sister and an equal than in this country, and is less subject to insult and to leering brutal comment there than here. We are her slave or her tyrant, so seldom her brother and friend. I thought it a significant fact that I found no place of amusement set apart for the men where one sex went, the other went. What was sauce for the gander was sauce for the goose, and the spirit that pervaded <coughs> prevailed was soft and human accordingly. The hotels had no ladies' entrance, but all passed in and out the same door and met and mingled commonly in the same room, and the place was as much for one as for the other. It was no more a masculine monopoly than it was a feminine. Indeed, in the country towns and villages, the character of the inns is unmistakably given by woman, hence the sweet domestic atmosphere that pervades and fills them is balm to the spirit. 
Even the larger hotels of Liverpool and London have a private, cozy home character that is most delightful. On entering them, instead of finding yourself in a sort of public thoroughfare or public cau caucus amid crowds of men talking and smoking and spitting with stalls on either side where cigars and tobacco and books and papers are sold, you perceive you are in something like a larger hall of a private house with perhaps a parlor and coffee room on one side and the office and smoking room and stairway on the other. You may leave your coat and hat on the rack in the hall and stand your umbrella there also with full assurance that you will find them there when you want them. If it be the next morning or the next week, instead of that petty tyrant, the hotel clerk, a young woman sits in the office with her sewing or other needlework and quietly receives you. She gives you your number on a card, rings for a chambermaid to show you to your room and directs your luggage to be sent up, and there is something in the look of things and the way they are done that goes to the right spot at once. At the hotel in London where I stopped, the daughters of the landlord, three fresh, comely young women, did the duties of the office, and their presence so quiet and domestic gave the prevailing hue and tone to the whole house. I wonder how long a young woman can pres uh, preserve her self-respect and sensibility in such a position in New York or Washington. The English regard us as a wonderfully patient people. And there can be no doubt we put up with abuses unknown elsewhere. If we have no big tyrant, we have 10,000 little ones who tread upon our toes at every turn. The tyranny of corporations and of public servants of one kind and another, as the ticket man, the railroad conductor, or even the country stage driver seem to be features peculiar to American democracy. In England, the traveler is never snubbed or made to feel that it is by somebody's sufferance that he is allowed to aboard or to pass on his way. If you get into an omnibus or a railroad or tramway carriage in London, you are sure of a seat. Not another person can get aboard after the seats are all full. Or if you enter a public hall, you know you will not be required to stand up unless you pay the standing up price. There is everywhere that system and order and fair dealing which all, which all men love. The science of living has been reduced to a fine point. You pay a sixpence and get a sixpence worth of whatever you buy. There are all grades and prices and the robbery and extortions so current at home appear to be unknown. I am not contending for the superiority of everything English, but would not disguise from myself or my readers the fact of the greater humanity and consideration that prevail in the mother country. Things here are yet in the green. But I trust there is no good reason to doubt that our fruit will mellow and ripen in time like the rest.